I'm here with Scott Lewis of Carnifex to talk about the upcoming new record, Necromantium, out October 6 on Nuclear Blast. Always a pleasure to talk to you about Carnifex. Thank you for taking the time to chat with me. How's things going on your end? Uh, thank you for having me. Things are going great. We're doing we're doing awesome. It's it's been fun to finally talk to some people that have heard the album. Yes, I have heard the album, and I have a lot of questions to ask you about said record. So let me start off by by asking you a question that I feel like it's important, at least for for my understanding of what this album represents. Do do you guys ever look back at what the sound, at what the experience, and what the end result of previous records were when you go into creating a new one? Yeah, yeah, definitely do. Um, I think the goal for us is really, or maybe not the goal, maybe that's the wrong word, but just what we strive for is there's always something you can find on a previous record that you feel like as the artist, like we could have done that better. And even now still, however many eight records deep, nine records deep, I still listen to each album and still feel like, okay, we could have done that better. Let's work on that for the next one. So yeah, we're always trying to improve, always trying to add a, another layer of atmosphere, something new, something more exciting for the audience and for ourselves. The reason I ask you that question is because when I was listening to this album, I, I could pinpoint some elements that you guys carried over from World War X and some elements that you guys carried over from Graveside Confessions, almost like you took the best pieces out of those two records and then you added a whole brand new layer of other things on top of it to give this album a sense of sequence but also give it its unique fingerprints do you see this record from that point of view that's a, a wonderful compliment thank you um maybe not quite that succinct but now that you said it i, I do see how that is kind of obvious actually which is funny i didn't think of that but really, I, I suppose what that is on our side is just a continued natural evolution, which, you know, for us, we're not following. There's no script for us to follow, so to speak. All we have for our inspiration is ourselves and our goals and trying to do better than we did last time. And so I think that it, the fact that it follows up those two records nicely and naturally is just evidence that we're always just going to be ourselves trying to do better than ourselves and it's really uh, we're metalheads at the end of the day you know we're we're fans of extreme music and so i think we're trying to just write records we would love and we get a little bit better at them each time and sometimes we focus on things a little bit differently each album or prioritize one thing over another but ultimately, we always start with the same intention, which is to write a record that, that we would love and write a better record than the one we just wrote. When it, came to, when it comes to those priorities, did you guys have any specific priorities for what you wanted out of this, this album? We wanted to have a good time. <laughs> you know, we wanted to have fun. Um, I think our goal was to be a little less serious. The last two records were really serious. Um, and then we, you know, we had a new writer with us. We had Neil with us, which was, which was awesome and really enjoyable. And so I think we were just trying to have fun with it. And we were working with Jason again out in Florida, which is awesome. We didn't get to do that on the last record. So I think we were just trying to enjoy the process, enjoy the writing experience, enjoy the songs that we wrote and just make the most of it while we were going through it. And I, and I think that joy came through it, our joy for metal came through in the music and and hopefully really gave the audience a, a very enjoyable record as well I, I felt listening to this album that you guys were able to achieve something that maybe other bands have tried to achieve but they don't always are able to do so which is create a record that's super heavy very brutal but not dense the the sound is really well textured nicely layered it, it's a it's a fun listening experience. It's easy to digest. It's not one of those records that when you get to the end of it, you're like, wow, that was fucking heavy. But everything kind of blends in together and it's kind of hard to pick a song that kind of stands out. So uh, how are you able to create an album that has that kind of dichotomy between the heavier side of the band and then still be able to allow the listener to experience it 
in a in a almost simplified manner? Um, you know, interestingly enough, and this is something that I never expected to hear, but uh, I forget where we, whether we were on tour or maybe it was uh, in a different interview, but uh, the person I was talking to was referring to us as melodic deathcore. And I never would, you know, you asked me 10 years ago if, if someone if would describe us as melodic deathcore, I, I probably would have laughed. But now in the context of hearing some of the, the newer bands and how far they push it to the extreme, and it, it's almost starting to sound like grindcore um it, it kind of makes sense and I, I think that might be what you're speaking to a little bit where the melody balances out the brutality and really i guess that's just us showing our influences you know we always were fans of black metal we've always been fans of the black dahlia murder who are a melodic death metal band you know carcass dissection in flames they're all melodic based metal bands and so I think for that to come out in our music and kind of give you that more listenable experience that you're describing, I think that's a lot of what that is, is is if you look at kind of the extreme spectrum that deathcore has been moving in as a genre, it's really getting extreme. And we've kind of stayed where we were. And I think now we're starting to sound more melodic because of that, just because kind of the threshold for what's considered brutal and intense has really just moved past us and and we're still doing our thing which is making us sound a little more melodic and and i guess a little less dense as, as you're saying but you know we're still heavy and still extreme no, it's it's still a brutal album I, I i would argue that it's as brutal as as any other record you guys have, have released it's just that it, it has that ability for maybe somebody discovering the band with this album. It, it's easier to get into the music. It's easier to get into the band. You're not, you're not jolted by it constantly. Yeah. I think that's, again, I think that's melody doing the heavy lifting there, you know, and, and Neil's a melodic writer as well. So I think his solos really contributed to that, that listenability, listenability factor. And I think the structure of the songs is not too jarring. You know, it, it is uh, it is a traditional structure in some sense, um, generally. And so I think that all those things contribute to it being something that's re-listenable. We're using the word or you're using the word melodic a lot. But what about groovy? I, I, is this a groovier Carnifex record? Um, groovy or no, I don't think so. Maybe. Is it? Did it say was it I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw a song at you. How the knife gets twisted. That that's a groovy track. Oh, okay. Yeah, that one is groovy, but um I would compare that to songs like uh Hatred and Slaughter and Collaborating Like Killers and All Roads Lead to Hell. I feel like we we always kind of have a track that has a little bit of a of a bounce in it. And I think that comes from being on the road so much. Where, whereas, you know, you learn and kind of get trained by the audience. Certain songs lend themselves to more audience interaction. And sometimes those groovy, bouncy songs, the crowd just loves those tracks. And it's like they can't get enough of them and they really work in the live setting. And that's, you know, we're not a studio band. We're not an internet band. We're a live band. We're on the road. And so we write music for a live audience. And those songs are always going to get on the record because we know how great they do live and how much fun the audience has with them. So, yeah, I guess there there is groove in there. I suppose I just, my perspective is maybe a little, a little different. And uh, speaking of the solos, you mentioned the solos. I think this album is packed with great solos, great guitar playing all around. Uh, is, is Do the guitars have a little bit of a bigger role or a bigger impact in the overall sound experience of uh, of this record? They do. They do. Yeah, and I, that's awesome that, that you picked up on that because that was one thing we really wanted to do. You know, even though we're doing the orchestrations and having the extra layers of atmosphere, we really wanted the guitars to still drive everything. And to us, death metal and death chord, it's guitar driven music. And so we wanted to make sure those that the guitar stays in the front seat and we don't let the melody or the atmosphere 
sort of take over and all of a sudden the guitars are chasing the strings. That was something that that we wanted to avoid. We wanted to keep it guitar driven, keep it about the riff, keep it about, you know, what to us death metal and deathcore was always about, which was the riff, you know. I've had the chance of listening to the album. Uh, first, I listened to the record on the car on my drive to work. And then I put headphones on and I experienced the album multiple times with headphones on. I got to tell you, it's like I was listening to two different albums because listening to the record in the car, I felt the guitars, I felt the drums, I felt your vocals. It was super brutal. The, 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 the symphonic elements were very subdued as they came out of the car speakers. Now, when you put good headphones on, then... It, it, it's like candy in your mouth like it starts to melt and everything <laughs> pops and and you can taste all the different ingredients it was such a great experience H have you been able to listen to the record in, in different mediums to see what kind of experiences you can get out of it i have um i obviously um i listen to it in the car of course and i listen to it here like on the studio the mixing speakers as, as it was being mixed um and then um i listen to it on my apple headphones but you know what the apple headphones aren't aren't actually that good to be honest <laughs> with you for music i mean they're great for like talking and phone calls but like if you put a big record on them the apple headphones don't really do them justice um so yeah i have listened to it in in through a few different systems and i, I get what you're saying how kind of depending on whether maybe you have a bass heavy system or or more of a surround sound type system you do get a different experience and I think that's just, you know, that goes to the fullness of the record. It it really fills up the the uh, audio spectrum. You know, every every aspect of that EQ wave is getting something. Um, and I think that's probably what comes out on a good pair of headphones. And that that's you know credit to Jason and and his mixing ability. Well, we've talked a lot about uh, a lot about things, but we haven't talked about your vocals. And I honestly feel like. This was one of your best vocal performances on, on, on a Carnifex record. I, I don't know if you were recording while in the shower. You sounded super relaxed. <laughs> you sounded super organic, natural, like 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 you're you were having breakfast and singing at the same time. It just it just came across <laughs> so natural. The, was there something different about this record for you? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, it's awesome to hear that because um, that was my more of my experience too. You know. Um, after so we did graveside you know we we did an interview for graveside and you probably remember we did it all right here in the studio yeah, yeah that was the first time i didn't go somewhere to track vocals and granted we were under you know the circumstances of the pandemic which had it, all its own challenges but when we got past that i still was like you know what i don't think i need to go anywhere to do vocals i i think i can just track them here and have sean track me and that's what we did. And it was really one of the best vocal tracking experiences I had because what you said was pretty much true. I would just sort of wake up, eat breakfast, <laughs> wander out to the studio and, oh, hey, let's do a song. And I had more time than ever, which, you know, when you go to a studio, let's say you get five weeks, the vocalist like always goes last. And so what ends up happening is well, the drums took an extra day. Okay, well, the guitars took two extra days. Okay, the bass took an extra day. Uh, leads took an extra day. And suddenly you get to vocals and they're like, yeah, well, we were supposed to have 10 days. Now we have four. That just like happens. Like it happened every time for years and years. And then I didn't go to the studio for graveside. And then I was just like, wait a minute. I'm just going to do them on my own time. So what we did this time around was John went to Florida and tracked drums, came back. And then why they were doing all the guitars, bass and leads, he and I were doing the vocals here. So we had like three weeks and we were able to do them in conjunction with guitars and bass getting done. And not only did it make the overall recording time a bit shorter, uh, but it gave me way more time. And I had Sean's undivided attention because, you know, he didn't have anything else to do. He wasn't working on the mix or, or or going back and maybe trying to fix edits or, you know, whatever a producer might be doing once all the everything else is recorded. 
Um, and it really worked out perfect. So I'm probably just going to continue to do that as we move forward. Yeah, you should, because it came out amazing <laughs> on the record. I honestly, I, I, I really love it. It feels, like I said, it feels so natural. And I think that adds a lot of richness to the overall sound and to the overall experience of the record. It's one of those albums that stands out in, a, in large part because of, of how you approached your vocal performance and, and how natural it blends with everything. You know, and also I'll say this too, is uh, we didn't use any fancy mic. I just used a SM58, the same mic that I would use on stage. And we didn't use a pop screen or a cradle or any of that. We did it very, very casually. And I think that's kind of that rawness or that naturalness that that, that comes through. It's it very similar to what I might do live. It, uh, while your performance was flawless, and, and very organic shower like like I said earlier uh, was there any song that that kicked your ass a little bit that took a little bit more out of you um I suppose they all they all do in some way um you know it's it's hard to say because I'm not you know I'm not a gifted writer I have to work on every song and and they all they you know I, I work on them to, until I can get them as as good as I can can. And I would say, I don't know about kicked my ass because I felt very comfortable and confident. I think we had a pretty clear vision for the album as far as what we wanted. And we had a lot of great motivation in that um, we had Neil writing with us. He's doing amazing. The guys were putting out great riffs. The songs were coming together. And when you have that kind of motivation, I think it, it's easy to have confidence. Um, it's the records that come together really slow where you're like, I don't know, is this good? Um, but we didn't have that on this album. We were feeling really great about it from from the first song. And so that really kept wind in my sails when it came time to do the patterns and the lyrics. And then on my uh, lyrically uh, um, for kind of really my specific job, I really had a theme that I was embracing, which really gives me a lot to work with when I'm writing. I'm not necessarily sitting there going, uh, what the hell should I even say? I, I really knew what I wanted to explore. And so that kind of that preparation of gathering up all that stuff before we actually got to writing the record really helped me hit the ground run. You mentioned something earlier about you guys being a, a live band. When when you're starting to record and you're starting to put your vocals down on tracks, do you immediately start to think of the songs that will become part of the new set list? Um, maybe not quite immediately, but once you're, once we have, a, you know, half the record, maybe, I think it, you kind of know which ones you're leaning towards, uh, that you want to play live. And then once the record's done, then I think you do, you know, you listen to it a few times and you kind of go, okay, let's pick these couple ones. And this tour that we're going to do coming up in the fall, uh, the, the album release tour, we're going to play uh, three or four new ones. And I think we kind of knew it was easy to pick those ones because we all kind of agreed like, yeah, that one. Yeah, that one. And, and actually on the Chelsea Grin tour uh, in, in the spring, the tour we did with them, we we started playing Torn and Two live, which fit right into the set and was super fun. And it actually for a brand new song that no one had heard that wasn't recorded and released anywhere, the audience really just picked up on it right away, which which is always awesome. Because sometimes you don't know how like a, an extreme song is going to translate in a live setting if no one's heard it before. So yeah, it's been great. You 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 spoke of the the tour that you're going to be on with uh, Signs of the Swarm in October, November, going October into November. Uh, they also just released a brand new record. Have, have you had a chance to listen to it? And and uh, what are your thoughts? I haven't listened to the whole record yet. I obviously heard the singles they put out. And, you know, we when we started speaking with them about doing the tour together, we, we knew they'd be on a new record. And that was, you know, that's always uh, a good match when the headliners got a new record and supports got new records and you, you put them together. That really makes it tour, the tour exciting and fresh. So it was one of the big reasons we, we wanted to bring them out with us. I mean, obviously, that band has grown a bunch in the last couple of years they're um, writing brutal records and it just seemed like the perfect match perfect time and so probably when i you know kind of get past uh because i'm i'm working on like a bunch of stuff right now uh it's i feel like the work never ends but 
um, when I kind of get this stuff behind me and I'm and I'm focused on the tour coming up, and I'll probably put it on while I'm working out. One last question for you. You mentioned the Chelsea Grin Tour. You guys play Toronto, sold out Opera House. I was there. What a night. I mean, like four outstanding bands. Uh, you, you guys absolutely killed it. Like the place, you could not fit a single more person in there. I mean, the place was <laughs> like, I don't think I've ever seen the Opera House that packed for anybody, for any show. Yet, you guys on this tour are not coming to Toronto. So when will we see Carnifax uh, on tour for, for this new record? Um, I think it's going to be this uh, spring 24 tour that we're actually working on right now. Uh, it's going to be like May of 24. And I'm pretty sure Tor Toronto is is on the lineup. Um, you know how it goes. It's the agents. It's not, you know, I'm not picking the city. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So um, the come to Brazil thing. Exactly. And uh, I, 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 you know, I love playing Canada. I really do. So I hope we get up there. And if for some reason we don't, I know we've talked about doing a full Canadian tour, which we haven't done one in years. Uh, so if it's not on that tour, it will be on the one after that. Uh, along with a lot of other Canadian dates, because we've we've said we need to do a full Canadian tour for years, and we just haven't got to it. But we're we're going to on this record for sure. You know, uh, fit for an autopsy in the Acacia Strain just did a whole Canadian run, just Canadian shows, and super mm. successful. Everything sold out. Great crowds. The merch was flying like hot cakes. So. Uh, <laughs> So th that will give you the motivation to get you guys up here uh, because you definitely have a huge fan base uh, in Canada and Toronto. And every time you guys play, people come out to support you. So uh, uh, try to make a track up here anytime you can. And in the meantime, everybody can enjoy the new record coming out October 6th on Nuclear Blast. Scott, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Uh, when I see you in Toronto, maybe we'll do a conversation in person. That would be super cool. Let's do it. Absolutely. All right, man. All the best. Take care. You too. Thank you for having me.